Well, welcome everyone. Hi, I'm Kimberly Dane. I am Dean of Student Services here at the University of Michigan Law School. I'm so excited that you all could join us today. We have a very distinguished keynote speaker, Ms. Ventina Chisholm Terry. She'll be joining us to deliver insight and a, an exciting and engaging conversation around the themes and the events that are taking place currently. We're going to begin with Ms. Hattie Mc, McKinney. Hattie, you're joining us? There we go. Hattie is going to welcome you. Hattie is our president of the Law School Student Senate. Hello, can you hear me? We can. All right. Hello, and thank you all for being here today. It is my pleasure to welcome our law school family and greater community to the 2021 Martin Luther King Day Lecture, honoring the life and works of the esteemed Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These are very challenging times. Our fellow citizens are struggling with COVID-19, economic uncertainty, racial injustice, and domestic terrorists threatening our democratic republic. This is not the first time that our country has faced a crisis of being and one of meaning. Dr. King led us through the first civil rights movement. And I have confidence that our generation will lead our country through this current devastation. Today, we will discuss the way forward with words from our Lieutenant Governor, Garland Gilchrist II, and our very own alumna, Ms. Ventina Chisholm Terry, Vice President of Metro Atlanta, and corporate relations for Georgia Power. We will use their insight and our talent and hard work to strengthen our community and our democracy. I'm glad to turn it over to our Lieutenant Governor, Garland Gilchrist, for his greeting. Greetings to the University of Michigan Law School community, Dean Mark West, Ms. Bentina Terry, and to the next generation of Michigan law lawyers. I am Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist II and I bring you greetings from the office of the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Michigan. We're joined today to celebrate and honor the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his life of service to his community, his country, and to mankind. The theme of this year's celebration is where do we go from here? Chaos to community. The demands of caring for the people of Michigan during this challenging time do not allow for me to join you live or in person today. But I wanna thank you and take a moment to commend you on your effort to build a strong community. You've made a difficult choice to care for your Michigan law community by creating and participating in a public health informed law school experience. You have exercised discipline, demonstrated compassion, endured isolation, and you have risen to the challenge. You have limited your personal freedoms to keep us all safer. You have been steadfast and resilient in your pursuit of your legal education. In the midst of it all, you have challenged the institution and all institutions to grapple with the impact of racism and the inequities that impact marginalized communities and you have demanded justice. You are committed to formulating a deep understanding of the rule of law and the role of lawyers as policymakers and advocates in a democratic republic. This gives me great hope for the future of our state and our country as we build, nurture, and reconcile our sometimes divided communities. I was trained as an engineer at the University of Michigan College of Engineering. One of your classmates has asked me, as a leader representing the entire state of Michigan, what is the most essential personal skill that you employ moving Michigan stakeholders from chaos to community? Well, it starts with recognizing that everyone has a role to play in the future that we wanna build. And as an engineer, as a problem solver, so putting together the components in this case, the people in the communities, so that we can find the solution that's gonna work best for the most people. That work takes time. You gotta be conscientious, you gotta be patient, but it can work. And we've seen that even in the midst of some of our biggest challenges in the last year. And I'm inspired by that progress we've made and hope we can pull it forward. I hope you find value in the insight that I've shared. There's much work to be done, and it will be an honor to work alongside your generation to lift up the people of Michigan and to empower them to realize the promise of our democracy. I thank you for your commitment, your service, 
and I want to celebrate the promise that you hold for a bright future of service. Thank you, keep standing tall, and go blue. We are so fortunate today to be joined by one of our own alumna, Ms. Pentina Chisholm Terry. She is Vice President of Metro Atlanta and Corporate Relations for Georgia Power, and she is a Michigan Law alumna from the class of 1996. The title of her lecture is going to be, Where Do We Go From Here? A Lawyer's Work in Moving from Chaos to Community. And it's so fitting, and we were so thrilled that she could join us because her career has really modeled the idea that in any given career choice, in any path you take as a lawyer, you can still have a key vital role in shaping your community. Ms. Terry is a Senior Vice President for Metro Atlanta and Corporate Relations for Georgia Power. And in this role, she's responsible for the company's operations, sales, customer service, economic and community development, and external affairs activities for more than 1.4 million customers across the Metro Atlanta, as well as statewide responsibility for Georgia Power's work in underserved communities, including people of color, the elderly, women, the LGBTQ community, she has made it her life's work to make her professional work service. Ventina is actively involved in community. She feels fortunate to work for a company that's a passion for the community it serves. She serves on the board of directors for International Women's Forum in Georgia, the Atlanta Police Foundation, Leadership Atlanta, the Grove Park Foundation, the Atlanta Beltline Incorporated, and the Atlanta Beltline Partnership. Which, of which she was the chair from 2001 to 2003. So this is her, her chairing year. We're really excited. Can't wait to see what happens with that. She's also on the campaign committee for the Woodruff Arts Center and the advisory council for Truist Atlanta Open. In 2020, she was named on the Greater Atlanta YWAC, uh, YWCA's Women of Achievement and has been named one of Atlanta's Business League's 100 Most Influential Women for several consecutive years. Bentina has a diverse career, has had a diverse career with Southern Company, beginning her career in 2001 at Georgia Power, and then serving as the senior executive at Southern Nuclear Operating Company and Gulf Power before returning to Georgia Power in 2017. During her Southern Company career, she has been responsible for many different areas, including external affairs, legislative and regulatory affairs, community and economic development, corporate communications, sales and marketing, customer service, compliance and ethic, corporate services, and aspects of power delivery. She's also served as general counsel and corporate secretary of Southern Nuclear. Prior to Southern Company, Bentina began her career practicing law with a firm with Troutman Sanders Law Firm in Atlanta and also served as the Associate General Counsel at Progress Energy in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's a native of Fayetteville, North Carolina. She holds her Juris Doctorate from, degree from University of Michigan Law and a Bachelor's of Arts in English from North Carolina State University. She's a member of the North Carolina State Bar and the Georgia State Bar Leadership Atlanta, Leadership North Carolina, Leadership Florida, the International Women's Florida, and of course, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, a member of the Lynx. And she's received various awards and recognitions for her contributions to the state of Florida, including being named uh, one of the Women of Influence Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in Florida Politics in 2015, and one of Florida Diversity Council's Most Powerful and Influential Women in 2012. She was also an International Women's Forum Fellow in 2012 and a 2017 graduate of the Atlanta Regional Commission's Regional Leadership Institute. She is married to the very handsome and very kind Antonio Terry and loves to play golf and runs marathons. But above all of that, what she is is a truly good person. There are people who in the course of your career, you model after. You look to them and think, that is the kind of person I wanna be when I grow up, even when you're grown up. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to share with you all one of the greatest treasures of my life, which is my friendship and um, the leadership 
and the Modeling of Professional Excellence of Ms. Ventina Chisholm Terry. Thank you, Kim. You are so incredibly sweet. I appreciate that. And um, I would make one correction. I, won, I run half marathons. As they say, I'm only half crazy. And so, um, but I appreciate that introduction and I appreciate too and value your friendship. It is a mutual admiration society. So, and I'm glad to be able to speak to you here today with the, the beauty of a virtual environment to speak to you from my office in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I love the University of Michigan um, and haven't, but haven't had many opportunities to return there. So it is both uh, with sadness that I do this from afar, but given the fact that it is January with a little bit of happiness that I get to do this from the warmth of Atlanta. So the, the topic today or the title of it is where do we go from here from chaos to community and I know that many of you already know that that was the last book written by Dr. King he wrote it while he was in solitude in the Caribbean. And it's one of his more interesting books. It, it has in recently gotten more and more attention, but for a while didn't. In fact, the New York Times, when they reviewed it, gave it a very kind of um, unhappy review in, in large part because Dr. King was moving from a message so much around race and the nonviolent civil rights movement to a message more broadly about people in the Vietnam War and economic independence. And, and so it was, it was mixed in its re received receipts, but if you read it now, the message is so profound in the times we live in. In fact, I thought a little bit about the title and I thought it is obviously fitting, but it is so fitting, so much so that it's almost a cliche. Um, and that we do find ourselves, as mentioned by Hattie, in a time of great chaos, but is a time too where we can and should all reflect on kind of that community piece. Now on that question about where do we go from here, often I've asked that myself, where do I go from here, from chaos to community? What does that really mean? And when I went to law school, I remember, and some of you may have had this experience, I would tell people I was going to law school and they would laugh and they'd think about ambulance chasers and, and, and things like that. And, and I would oftentimes rebut that by talking about the lawyers that I thought of, like Thurgood Marshall. You know, and at the famous line from Shakespeare that says, um, first, let's kill all the lawyers, right? Because that's how you bring anarchy to society is by not having lawyers. And so I went to law school for all the noble reasons to go to law school. My mom um, had um, been medically discharged from work uh, and she alleged that she had been sexually harassed. They kind of settled the claim and my mom ended up coming home and, and stopped working and they paid her for quite a long time. And that made, that was one of the things that influenced me to go to law school. And the other thing was that she and my dad set a, a wonderful example for me. And they would say often, as many of you have heard from your parents, to whom much is given, much is required. Or to say what Dr. King would say, life's urgent and most persistent question is what are you doing for others? So I went to law school believing that I wanted to make a difference in the lives of others. And at the time when I applied for the University of Michigan, I was very, very excited because Catherine McKinnon and Julia Ch Julius Chambers were both there. Catherine McKinnon, for those of you who don't know, is a renowned feminist and she had a clinic there. And then Julius Chambers at the time was the um, head of the NAAC Legal Defense Fund. And the opportunity to go to the University of Michigan and study at the feet of those two giants was just so tremendous for me. So I left the warmth of North Carolina uh, and traveled northward uh, to go to the University of Michigan, excited about the opportunity. And I really, really believed that my goal in life was to be one of those people who worked in a nonprofit or worked uh, in a governmental agency, but all around the rights of people. I was going to be a warrior for the rights of people. And so in fact, I spent um, part of my time in law school working at a union side labor law firm that was down, down in Detroit. And I would also say that was the first time I started to ask myself, chaos or community? Which side do I wanna be on? And are the sides as clearly defined as I thought? So I remember working at the law firm and thinking that I couldn't type my own briefs. I had to hand write my briefs and hand them to the admin because the admins were unionized. And so I wasn't allowed to type. Now that sounds completely crazy to many of you. I, 
In fact, when I went to undergrad, I started off writing, but by the time I finished undergrad, we were all on computers. I don't know that I knew how to write longhand a brief, but because word processing and computer typing was in the purview of the work for the administrative assistants at the law firm and they were unionized, as an intern, I couldn't type my own briefs. So that was the first time that I kind of went, okay, so what's that about? And then I handled a number of cases while I was there. I remember um, there was a pharmacist who was represented by the local union and he had a hoarding issue, a psycholog psychological issue with hoarding things. And so what he'd been doing is stealing from the pharmacy and hoarding the drugs. Uh, he wasn't selling them, um, he, so he wasn't making any profit off it, but obviously he had a, a profound mental issue and he had been fired by the pharmacy. And my job was to get his job back. And I remember thinking that as a pharmacist, I mean, these are the people that you go to for advice, that if a pharmacist does something wrong, it could grossly impact your health. And I was on the side of trying to get this person back their job. And that was probably the second time I asked myself while working at that law firm, huh, chaos or community? So then I worked one, one DC in uh, summer in DC. I was uh, I did the student funded fellowships. I don't know if they still had those, but I did one of those and I worked in Washington DC. I worked for the Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division, uh, voting rights section. I was so incredibly excited. I loved it. I thought it was great. I loved being in DC. It's such a wonderful city. Uh, I got an offer from them coming out of law school, but I also got an offer to clerk with Justice Henry Fry and um, he was just, or is, because he is still living, uh, just a legend in North Carolina. I uh, was on the North Carolina Supreme Court. He was the first Black North Carolina Supreme Court Justice and Chief Justice. He was one of the first Black U.S. attorneys in North Carolina and one of the first Black legislators in the North Carolina legislature post-reconstruction. In fact, when he served in the North Carolina legislature, he served alone as the only Black person there. And Justice Fry made it his mission to make sure he gave you a lesson about service. So the entire time I worked for him, he would ask me, but not in these terms, of course, what did I wanna choose? Did I wanna choose chaos or community? And how would I wanna do that? And I really thought about that. And I was very torn coming out of my clerkship with him. I could have gone to a nonprofit. I could have gone up to Washington DC again and worked for, um, for, for government again, like I did that summer, I could have gone to a law firm. And I remember thinking at first that going to a law firm was really selling out. But I'll be honest with you, as I was still struggling with this issue of chaos with community, I was also struggling with the fact that I owed practically to debtors a small house or very expensive car, just depends on your perspective. And I came from a family that didn't have the money or the means to help me. And so I decided to go to a large law firm in Atlanta, Georgia. And I still wasn't sure whether or not I was choosing chaos or community, but what I was sure of was that I needed a couple of years to get myself financially viable. It was very important to me, it was important to my family. I was the first person in my family to graduate from law school and one of the first my generation was the first to even graduate from an undergraduate institution. So it was very, very important. So from there, how, how did I end up here? And how again does that relate to this whole concept of chaos and community? Well, I learned a very valuable lesson probably over the course of that period of time. First of all, my brother who's passed away used to always tell me there are no angels and there are no devils, Bentina. And I am old enough to know that yet yeah, there are devils and we've all seen or heard about people who are truly depraved and there are angels, but most people, the vast majority of people, the vast majority of issues, they really do lie in the gray area. They don't lie in the, the black and the white. And when you think about chaos and community, sometimes you have to ask yourself, well, but how do I define chaos and community? I think that oftentimes we believe, especially as lawyers, and if you're a lawyer 
a person like me who grew up believing in or or having people around me or exposed to people who were always fighting that good fight, um, who were defending the little guy, they were defense attorneys or they were working at nonprofits or they were doing that work. And somehow you get yourself to believing that that is the only way you can choose community. And I believe that for years. And then I thought again about that law firm. I actually think I was a little bit of chaos there. I'm not sure that defending a pharmacist who was obviously had some mental kind of issues to go back and dispense drugs was really helping this community. And so I started thinking about it, in particular when I was working at the law firm. I was a labor and employment lawyer, and I asked myself many times, What happened to our sound? And your sound is... Yeah, so somehow I got is. muted. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> Thanks so for somebody who just asked that. I appreciate that. I often find myself being the voice of conscience in the room, the person who talked to the client about settling the case as opposed to fighting it, the person that talked about how we could learn from the case that we had with a business how we could do more training for the leaders who worked in that business, how we could do more work with making that business better. Georgia Power, who I now work for, in fact, was one of my clients. At that time, they had about 15,000 employees. And what I really, really asked myself is if I can teach those folks at Georgia Power to be better leaders, if I can teach them to be better managers, if I can oh. teach them to be better, okay. I can impact 15,000 employees. And when I do that, aren't I actually choosing community? And so I, I changed my, my, my whole paradigm around what it meant. And I didn't think staying at a law firm was the best thing for me. There were too many fights to fight. I didn't really like the whole idea of the partnership track. I didn't want to get clients and go through that type of process. I wanted really to help people, but I really started asking myself, how can I prevent the injury as opposed to bandaging the knee, right? How could I stop things from happening as opposed to taking care of them once they happened? And so I looked around, I knew a little bit about Georgia Power and I recognized it was a company that cared deeply about its communities and did it long before it was fashionable. Right, long before people were writing articles about it, long before there were stewardship guides and corporate social responsibility and, and ESG, long before all of that, Georgia Power had pledged to be a citizen wherever it served. It had a big medallion that it hung on the wall in its corporate office that employees walked by every day. It was on the carpet in the logos that you saw when you walked around. It was in the words that they spoke when you met with leaders. They were by no means perfect, no institution is and still is not. But I, what I realized is that I could work for a company that was actually going to be more invested in the greater good. There's a little saying that we say in my line of business that you know it sounds real Southern, which you guys know I'm from North Carolina, but there's nothing better than preaching the gospel, tilling the soil and working for the power company. And that's not true at every power company, but that was true at this one. And so what I realized when I got there is that if I picked a company that really truly believed in and invested in the community, I could choose community. I feel fortunate to work for that type of company and I could use my influence to build community. Now it's a lot more in vogue now. There's a lot more companies that preach that as a part of their mantra. I'd only challenge you to make sure that it's real. It's not just part of their PR statements. But even if you do find yourself somewhere where it's not the complete culprit culture, it can still be what you do. So what I do every day is I push my company to have policies that are in the best interest of the employees. I use my power, I'm a senior vice president, and my influence to make that happen. I use my power and influence within the company to talk about 
money, where we spend it, how we spend it, who we give it to. And more importantly than that, I use my power and influence within the company to mentor and sponsor other young, mostly, but not always just African-American females to give them something that I didn't get a whole lot of because there weren't a whole lot of people like me in leadership at Georgia Power, but now there are lots and there are even more because I know that on my back, there's another person that's gonna climb up. And that's how you take chaos from community. I've also been able to use my influence and you see it in my bio to figure out and completely be immersed in how my company gives to my community. From sitting on the boards that you've gotten here, I've chaired a number of events. In the last two years, I've raised about $5 million in charity money for nonprofits in Atlanta that I sat on the board for for the events that they had. I've been able to contribute money and to bring the company's attention to organizations like the Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, which works to make better, provide better resources for African-American entrepreneurs to build wealth in the African-American community here in Atlanta, a community that has the highest difference between our haves and our have not than any other city in the United States. I've been able to work with the Urban League to ensure that we've given well over millions of dollars to them, an organization that works not just in the grassroots, but in the policy of making equity real, not just in the state of Georgia, but across our country. I've been able to engage with organizations. There's one here in Atlanta that's not on my resume that's called SOAR, Saving Our Atlanta Area Residents. It was an organization that was created after the pandemic and I sat on the, the kind of governing group for it to create it. That's about how we help Atlantans once we get on the other side of the eviction moratoriums. All those people that will lose their jobs. I get to bring my influence other people's money and my company's money to organizations like that. And I get to use my relationships to influence legislation and things that happen within the state of Georgia in particular. So it just is something I'd like us all to keep in mind. Don't fall for the you gotta go work for a nonprofit or you have to go work in government in order to make a difference. Every day you get to choose whether or not you want chaos or community in your personal life and in your professional life. It's not about where you are. It's about who you are. So there are a couple of quotes from Dr. King that I absolutely positively love. And we all know them from evil for evil to succeed. All is needed is for good men and women to do nothing. The ultimate measure of a man or a woman is not where she or he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but it's where he stands at times of challenge and conversation controversy. Our lives begin to end the day when we become silent about things that matter. So whether, no matter where you are, whatever path you choose once you leave the University of Michigan, make sure you always choose community. Make sure you always take the time and ask yourself, are you really doing something that is good? And what's that good look like where you sit? So I'd like to leave with one thing, one thing that really kind of relates back to the events that are going on today and a little bit less about the chaos to community, even though I guess everything now feels like it's about that. One of the things, if you haven't read Dr. King's book, is there's a theme that runs through the entire book that's about hope. And I always tell people, um, I'm 50 years old. I've got a 26 year old niece who, uh, I don't have children, so she is my child. She means the world to me. And every time I'm with her and every time I listen to her, I am filled so much with hope because I believe that she will do things better and more than I ever could have dreamed of. I believe the next generation is so much better with things. But I tell you this, in that book, Chaos to Community, there's a quote and it says, first the line of progress is never straight. For a period, a movement may follow a straight line and it encounters obstacles. The path bends. It is like curving around a mountain where you are approaching a city. Often it feels as though you are moving backwards and you lose sight of your goal. But in fact, 
you are moving ahead and soon you will see the city again closer by. So don't let the things that are going on in this world today discourage you. Remember those words from Dr. King and remember to have the hope that while things look pretty crazy right now, look pretty much like chaos, it is always moving closer to community. Thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful words. Um, I know we have quite the audience here today. If folks want to, in the chat, send questions to me, I'd be happy to moderate those. And hopefully our distinguished speaker will be willing to share some more wisdom with us. We had a student raise a question earlier about what are the points of entry as a young associate, so you're starting out as a young associate at Troutman, you know, do you keep your head down and, and move forward quietly? How do you find those points of entry when you are still, you know, jealously guarding your career and making sure that you don't upset the apple cart too much, but at the same time are able to exert influence? How do you do that as a young associate? So I think one of the most important things you do early in your career is that you you find mentors, right? You find people that you trust that you can talk to and who can advise you about the politics of your firm and the things in your firm that are most interesting. Um, that you, you really need to figure out how you, how you flex those muscles. I would also say that um, if you put aside the work that has to be done, I think oftentimes when people to think about this chaos to community type work, they forget that if you're at a law firm, your job is actually to get the billable hours. So unless you're gonna to leave tomorrow, you gotta to do your base work. So you gotta get the hours that you need and you have to do the legal work and it has to be clean. But on top of that, you've gotta look for opportunities that will allow you to build that base and exert those influence. Sometimes that's taking on a project or working with a partner who you know has that type of interest or in areas that may not be your primary practice area where the firm has interest, or one of the things that I did, of course, when I was in law school, many young lawyers do, is I got engaged with the, the clinics and the, um, the volunteer lawyer associations um, where you could go in and you could help indigent clients and kind of flex those muscles as a lawyer. But what I'd say is the number one thing you need to do when you get to a law firm is find somebody who has been there longer than you that you can trust and build a relationship with them so that they can help you. haven't gotten any questions yet. I know there are 130 people in the audience and I know at least one person has a question. So one of the questions I get the most is how do you end up where I am, right? And mm -hmm. so you start off practicing law in a law firm and then you end up a, a senior vice president. I'm on the business side. At the, the work that I do in the community is part of my job, but it is not my entire job. I do a lot of other stuff that is truly business related for my company. And I would tell you that I didn't plan this path. And that's, think that's one of the things that we start to believe is that it's all a series of steps that are, are meticulously planned. It was not meticulously planned. It was taking advantage of lots of opportunities uh, that were presented before me, as well as being thoughtful about my career. But it, it's in any regard, nobody's path, everybody's path looks different. Nobody's path looks the same. And so as you go through your career, you'll find your own path that will hopefully allow you to do some of the things you'd like to do as well. We have a question from Professor Friedman. Hi, um, well, thank you and uh, welcome back uh, virtually. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, you've uh, uh, portray portrayed a, um, a very favorable uh, portrait of your company, which is, uh, which is good. And I'm wondering, do you have any sense of uh, why it, why it is that way? Or what's the history or the, what's the source of that? Because not yeah. all companies are like that. So some, something made it that way. So we laugh inside and we say it's in the DNA. It's in our DNA, right? Um, but we've actually written a history book. And in that history book, um, it actually talks about how we um, came up with the phraseology of citizen wherever we serve. If you think about utilities, um, 
in particular, when we, you know, we really revolutionized the South, right? The air conditioning came and utilities just, just completely blossomed and grew, but um, it was a regulated environment where you weren't able to choose your power producer. And here in the South, you still, you still can't. I am the, the monopoly, if I can say it that way. Um, and so we would have to though go into communities in the beginning and essentially ask them to let us serve them. Uh, and so part of that made us really think about very early on how important we had to be to our communities. And over time, it's also made us always think, it's one of the things we tell people, we tell our customers, you didn't get to choose us, I never want you to regret that, right? And so we kind of play the long game and we think about our communities as our partners and recognize that if we have an antagonistic relationship with our communities, it threatens our company as well. You know, you don't pick up a utility and move anywhere, right? You, we are here, these communities are our communities, our employees live in these communities. And so the health and the prosperous nature of those communities is important to us from a business standpoint, as well as from a company standpoint and, and a personal standpoint. And so um, I think that what happened after it was initially built in, as, which is why we say it's in our DNA, is it is in our values. And so when you talk about your culture, when you talk about how you onboard new employees and what types of employees you look for, you don't have to be around very long before you are hearing this. You're a citizen wherever we serve. We have employee volunteer groups. We have a robust foundation. We have people like me and the company who are engaged in the community. And so it's, um, it's just a very, it's a very strong part of, of our DNA, who we are. And employees who come to the company who don't value that don't move into leadership. It's one of the things that um, is clear that if you aren't someone who cares about the communities and the customers that we serve, you will not have a great career here at Southern Company. Thank you for that. Um, Bentina, what is the most important thing you learned in law school? And is there something that you learned in law school that you still use in your career today? Uh, I think that the, the thing that I had it before I went to law school, but that was really honed in law school was intellectually intellectual curiosity. And uh, I, I find um, no matter what role you're in, no matter what you're doing, if you are listening to what people are saying, but not thinking about it and asking yourselves questions about what they're saying and why they're saying it, then you're, you're not helping people get to the right answer, whether or not that is your client uh, as a lawyer, or for me, my company, as we run our business. And so um, at Michigan, that skill is really honed in you to be intellectually curious Quite honestly, I think that what's happening in our country right now is because we don't have nearly enough people who are intellectually curious who try to find out and figure out the answers on their own. It, I've, I've just been thinking to myself, there's an old uh, Eddie Murphy stand-up where he's talking to his girlfriend and she's caught him cheating. And he goes, you gonna believe me or your lying eyes? And so there's a little bit of, of that right? People not really being curious and using all of their senses and all of their intellect to figure out what's truly going on. And I think that law schools like Michigan really hone that ability, ability in you to ask the next question. Uh, and it's, it served me well in my career, even when it made other people uncomfortable that I had to ask the next question. Uh, it was a great thing to be able to do. Thank you for that. Okay, maybe the chat's not working because I just got an email um, with a question from a student. So I'm gonna go to that. What is your advice for being mindful about inclusion as you choose community? So do you first forage for your seat at the table or can you lift as you climb? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm trying to, I think I've done I lift as I climb, right? Because if you if you're just thinking I want to fight for my seat at the table, even if and then I'll reach back, what happens sometimes is, and I've seen this happen with another officer, 
by the time you get to the table, whatever that table is, and that table may constantly move, which is part of why you know, fighting for your seat at the table, which table do you mean? Is it the first job you get to or is it the fifth job you get to? Is it the senior executive job you got to or the first level manager job you got to? Um, is it the partner job or the senior associate, right? If you're always thinking, well, once I get there, I'll bring others up, then sometimes it takes you a long time. And in some companies or some places, you build a reputation as someone who doesn't lift people up. And it makes it very difficult if you really want to do that for people to trust that that's really where you are. And then I think what I also is an undercurrent in that is there's always a next table. There's always a next place that you're going. And so you can't wait till you get there, wherever there is. You've got to always be thinking about taking people to a new place, a new opportunity. So even before I got to be a senior executive, what I was working on is can I mentor and move people up into a, a great project that I think is great for them to have or that first supervisor job right when I was a manager or or helping to rehabilitate a reputation that had gotten injured or banged up somewhere along in their career and so I think that if you bring people along if you're always thinking about how you help somebody else both in your setting and outside of your setting then you're really moving things forward. The other way isn't bad. I just don't find it to be likely as effective. And so it, se it seems like some of you don't have the chat function available to you. So if you want to just email me questions directly, it's stetson at umich.edu. I'm monitoring that and can, can ask the question. Um, you spoke of one challenge that young warriors may face is feeling like a sellout if they choose a certain path, like maybe going to a corporate law firm. Are there other common challenges that you see young warriors facing and you have advice on how they might navigate those challenges or decisions as they move through their career? Yeah, so I, um, I think as a young lawyer, sometimes um, everybody does in every profession, every career, it's wanting the answers, wanting to know everything very quickly um, and not necessarily always being comfortable with, um, with things coming over time. And so what I find with, with young lawyers, young employees is there is that, that desire to do so much that makes them the people that you want on your team, but this sense that there aren't things they need to learn or pick up on or kind of pace themselves about. And it's okay, you know, I, you don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know your complete life path the first day that you start. In fact, you're probably wrong if you think you do. And so um, one of those is not just taking your time to learn your trade, to learn your area, to learn your business uh, and to recognize that um, there, there is some time for you to get wherever it is you, you'd like to be in life. Um, I think that's probably the biggest obstacle I see with, with most people early in their careers. Now we got a buzz. So, um, Miss Mariah Benford. Hi. Um, I had a question that I want to say relate to you or just ask you about. Um, have there been any obstacles that you faced by being a Black woman in this field? And if so, what would you like, what advice would you give to someone who is inspired by your work and have seen like all that you've done? And I, I want to be there, right? <laughs> but I know there's always some type of opposition and some things that we face as being a Black woman in this world, so. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, discrimination, harassment, craziness, right? Stuff that I couldn't put my finger on, but I knew wasn't quite right. Um, I've encountered all of that in my career. And um, what I'd say is first, the first thing I always say is that you have to have some grace. And what I mean by that is oftentimes what we do is when people say or do things that we, we find objectionable, um, we automatically go to this sense of righteous indignation. I'll give you a really good example. When I first started working I was in new employee orientation. I was sitting next to a, a white gentleman who happened to be a little older, must have been his third or fourth career or something, I don't know, but he was in new employee orientation. And he asked me uh, where I was from. And I said, I'm from North Carolina. 
And then he said, oh, and then we got to talk and I said, I was a lawyer. He said, where'd you go to law school? I said, I went to the University of Michigan. And he said, wow. Now, how did you get to the University of Michigan? And I sure did. I thought, no, he didn't. Just what do you think? I was an affirmative action hire. And I, you know, all this stuff buzzed through my mind. And it was like a split second later, he said, because I don't know why anybody would go from North Carolina to Michigan, not to offend, but you know, it's cold up there, y'all. And I stopped for a second. I always think about that example. That man had no intention of insulting me. That was not what he was trying to do. But I had my back so much looking for it that I couldn't give him grace, that I couldn't allow him the opportunity to say whatever he was trying to say. I tried to make him say what I wanted to think he said. And so, and then there are gonna be times when people do say things that are wrong, are crazy, are just not quite right. And to some degree I've learned in my career that sometimes, not all the time, I have to give people grace. I have to think about where they're actually coming from and give them the opportunity to not mean what I think they think I heard. And that goes to the second point, is if you spend your career looking for those obstacles and barriers, then you will always see them. And it's not that I want any of you to be blind to everything that occurs, but it's just like there's a um, theory in, um, in race theory that about stereotypes, of course, that says if you believe something about a certain race, you will always see it no matter what they do, right? So if you believe they're lazy, the guy who's standing on the corner, of course, who's black is lazy. Right, And so if you always see racism and sexism, if you see the world through that lens, then it colors it a shade that is not very pleasant and you're not always right. And so while I've had many obstacles in my life, I am sure that some of them I have not seen and I'm okay for that. The ones that I have seen, the times I have encountered obstacles based on me, my race or my gender or my age early in my career, it was I was the youngest person oftentimes in a room um, I tried to ask myself, is this person in my sphere of influence or are they just a random person? And if they were a random person, I didn't let that, let them bother me. If they were in my sphere of influence, goes back to my earlier comment about mentors and other people that can help you. I went to other people to ask how I could get my way around them. And sometimes they would tell me, don't worry about it. Everybody knows that that's how that person is. They've discounted that statement long before they've said it right, or something like that. And sometimes they've helped me actually get away from that person or that burial, that obstacle. Thank you for being so articulate and answering my question. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. We have Reggie. Great, thanks Dean Dane. And thank you so much for giving the talk today. I really appreciate it. Um, sort of going off the other question that you answered, um, how do you, I guess, deal with pushback in a space? I worked at sort of like a law firm, a big law firm that was predominantly white and just pushing for resources for minority employees was like incredibly difficult to get even an inch. And so um, being at the great position that you are, how do you deal with pushback in that sphere? So um, there's a great book I love. It's called The Secret Handshake and it's about politics. Um, and I always give it to my employees to read um, because everything that you do quite honestly is a little bit about politics. And oftentimes we go into situations so gung-ho about what we want that we don't really think about the kind of mutual exchange that occurs in any relationship or any conversation where your job is actually sometimes to help that other person understand how what you want is in their best interest. And your job also is to understand what they want out of that exchange. And so when I find myself in a place of pushback, what I try not to do, no try, I'm not always successful, is to not just continue to hammer what it is I want or what I'm thinking, as if saying it over and over again is gonna convince that person. I try to take a step back and ask myself, where are they coming from? What do they want? And how can I figure out something that's mutually agreeable, helpful to them? And that may require me to make a slight, a slight compromise uh, in what I was trying to get, uh, but it oftentimes leaves you and the other person a lot more happier from the exchange. So when you get that pushback, just try to figure out a way to 
to figure out what's going on and get to a place that's better. When you get the ultimate pushback, which means you can't seem to make any, you try all the end runs and all that kind of stuff, you can't really get it. I think you just have to ask yourself, how important is it to you? Uh, and there'll be times in your career where it will be so important that leaving will be what you decide to do. And there are other times where you go, I'm going to live to fight another day. I'm just going to put that one aside and I'm going to figure out something else. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Welcome. You're on you. You. <laughs> we have a question from the person who I like to call uh, future governor of Michigan, uh, Chuck Mahon. <laughs> okay, that, that's a big lead up. It, I have a very quick question. Um, and you spoke about it briefly, but I want to ask you directly, when you were in positions that you don't have as much maybe as gra much gravitas as you do now, how did you make sure that your work, specifically those things that were focused on community impact, or at least understanding the community or seeing how you could be engaged in the community, how did you ensure that didn't come at the detriment, or at least the perceived detriment of the work you were there doing for the company, whether that be from your bosses or your peers or whatever it may be? So um, it, you're very right. And it, it, it really always does go to your baseline. Fundamentally, what's your responsibilities? And I tried to make sure that that was always done. But you bring up a very good point that I find sometimes is that regardless sometimes of whether or not you're actually covering all those bases, people may have a perception that because you are in the community or doing things in the community, you're not. And then part of that is about what one of the things that I always tell um, folks when I counsel them in their careers is about building that brand for yourself. And building that brand means that you'll oftentimes have to do things that may seem a little bit much kind of in order to help people know that you're accomplishing or doing what you need to accomplish or do. So whether or not that's an update to your boss about the business stuff that you've done on a regular basis so they don't ask the questions or so that if someone else asks the question, your boss can say, no, I, those things are taken care of, I know. It just may be that you've got to publicize sometimes a little bit more the foundational pieces of what you do so that people know that those things are done uh, and, and make sure truly that it is not to the detriment. I have not personally, but have counseled employees who've worked for bosses who didn't value the community piece. And so any community stuff they did, the boss, regardless of whether or not they were getting it done, didn't value it. And I think then you're back to asking yourself the questions about where you are and how long you'll be there and what that means, right? Is, is this someone you're gonna have to work under or with for a long time? Can you get to another place in the organization that has more value? That type of stuff are the questions sometimes you'll have to ask yourself. Thank you for that. And also thank you for joining us for uh, Brother King's birthday. I know he appreciates it and also 06. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I have on my pearls today. So I want to be respectful of your time. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, sure, I do. Okay. We, um, we're off today, which is awesome. So okay. Well, a lot of companies, as you mentioned, make community a part of their PR, but not necessarily their mission. Can you give advice to our students on how to identify if community is actually part of a company's mission when they are on the outside trying to assess maybe a future employer or someone to engage with? So I think you asked some questions like, do they have individual or individuals within the company that are responsible for that particular area or mission, right? So a company that, that doesn't, you have to ask yourself, how is that happening, right? Is there, because if there's not someone kind of in charge of it, then it may just be more of a PR thing. Uh, and in most good companies do, they have a corporate sustainability office or they have uh, someone who's working on ESG work around the stakeholder work, or they have a foundation. That's another great question to ask. Do they have a corporate foundation that they give to, that's their money that they spend in the community? Do they have a community relations department or a corporate relations department? You know, kind of try to figure out from a structural standpoint about that. And then part of what you can do when you ask questions or you do research is find out, do employees contribute and how much do they or participate or, or how much do they participate, right? So is it a program that there's executives who are doing 
kind of PR -y type stuff, but if you ask the average employee, they don't know anything about it. They don't know what it is, what it does. And if you, when you interview, if you get that far, you can ask those kind of questions and figure out whether or not it is cultural or whether or not it is PR. But the, the quickest thing to do, you know, is to do the, the kind of research on their website, their LinkedIn pages, to see if they've got pictures of employees who employees doing work is a lot more meaningful than announcements that they're that the company has given away a million dollars. Not that that's not good, that's awesome, but it probably isn't in the culture if you don't see volunteer activities with employees. So you mentioned LinkedIn. Um, many of our students are active on social media. So do you use social media? And if so, do you have any favorite professionals or people who inspire you that you would recommend to our students? Oh, so I am probably, um, no, not probably. I'm not, I'm not a good person to ask that question. I do, I have a LinkedIn profile and I'm very religious about my LinkedIn profile because of that whole brand thing and my Facebook profile. I have a Twitter account, but I don't tweet. <laughs> I just go in and read people's tweets. Um, and so I'm active on social media from that perspective, probably I'm more active on Facebook, but it's part of my personal brand. You'll see things in there about my family, about running, about what's going on in the world. It, and it's just building my, my brand, but I, I don't really, um, I don't really have a bunch of people. I have a bunch of people that I follow. I don't really have a favorite. So, sorry. Can you talk a little bit more about how students might think about building their own brand? and what they should be considering at this stage early in their careers? Yeah, it, it's never too early to start thinking about your brand. Uh, and because what you do over time is that you look for things that reinforce that brand that you want to build. The best way to start with building your brand is to truly understand how other people see you today. And so if you can ask people who are close to you or who know you or work with you or see you a lot, they'll tell you what they see as your brand. They may not articulate it that way because it's not, um, if you go ask people, what's my brand? They're gonna look at you like, I don't really know. Say, what am I known for? What do you think I'm really good at? Or what is it that people think I could, I could do better? What do you see? What do you think of when you think of me, right? Those are the questions that can elicit from folks what your brand is and then you decide from there kind of how you want to deal with that brand. That may mean that you hear things that you don't like. So you have to ask yourself, how do you pull that back? It's really funny. Early in my career, I had a, they sent me to a, um, the company I worked for sent me to, wasn't Southern company, sent me to a consultant to do kind of these surveys and stuff. So I got all these 360s from other people talking about me. And one of the things that came up, and I think it was because quite honestly, I was a little heavy was that people didn't think I was physically active, which was a little odd. And nowadays, I don't know that we would talk about that at work, but at this point in time, we were. And I was talking to the coach about it afterwards, the, the coach in the program, and she said, are you physically active? And I said, yeah, I've always been physically active. I just, like a lot of people, you know, my, my weight goes up and down. And she said, start bringing your gym bag to work. Start bringing it in put it on the floor next to your desk or on the counter. And before I knew it, I had a brand as someone who worked out regularly because people always saw me with my gym bag. And that may sound, you know, I, I don't know that that's the brand you want to build, but it's just a clear example of how easy people um, can be influenced by behaviors and activities they see you do repetitively. And so figure out what that brand is that you want to build and then do behaviors that reinforce that brand. But you know, I mean, don't, don't try to be something that you can't really be because behind the brand, there's gotta be real actions, right? So I'm carrying that gym bag around and then everybody's like, Natina actually never, I've never seen her in a pair of tennis shoes. I mean, they, then they'd be like, it's just a, just a farce. So you do have to have some realness behind that brand. Thank you for that really thought provoking response. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, I just got another question from a student. Um, we have uh, 
a decent population here of first generation law students. Mm -hmm. And um, this particular student has asked, you know, if when you were a student, um, did you ever feel a sense of academic alienation at Michigan or in a professional space? Or do you have advice for first generation students who might feel that way? Yeah, so I, I, I did not enjoy my time, all of it at Michigan, right? I made some phenomenal friendships. Um, I had some thought provoking professors. I don't remember my tax professor's name, but I took tax because he was pretty awesome, which is a really good reason to take tax, but Logue. he was. Kyle Logue. Uh, yeah. And so it was just a, um, but I think that part of why I didn't always enjoy it was that I did at times feel isolated. And I did at times feel like there were things going on that I didn't have access or exposure to. Um, I think that the law school is probably better at that now than it was then. But there was so much that my peers who had had more exposure to um, other people had gone to law school before them or relatives uh, who understood the legal profession had than I ever had. And so it felt sometimes like I was trying to make it up on my own to try to figure it out. And I don't know that I knew where to go to get it. And so, you know, in retrospect, I probably should have gone to people like Dean Kim <laughs> and asked for help, you know, and tried to find a way to to make those connections that I, I wasn't making academically. Um, and then, and I was, look, I was in Balsa. Um, I wanna say I was president, but I don't remember. I think I had an office in Balsa. I was a Butch Carpenter um, awardee. And so I was, I was very, I was on the journal of gender uh, and law. I think that journal still exists at Michigan. And so I did find places and ways to, to, to connect, but I never felt connected. Um, and I, I, what I would say is in retrospect, I just probably should have found some more ways to do that. I don't even know what all of them are, but I would have started with people like Dean Kim probably. So, so there'll be a line outside your door, Kim, sorry. <laughs> Her virtual door. Her virtual door, that's right. I hope so. That is um, both Dean Stetson and I are new to the position of the Office of Student Life. And that is one of, we just spent the afternoon planning out, you know, what are ways that we can make resources more evenly available to students relative to things you wouldn't know to ask. You know, that, that's what I felt like as the first generation lawyer was, I didn't know what to ask. I just saw people doing things around me and tried to kind of catch up and figure it out. Well, that's much harder in a virtual setting. And so, we are you know, working on being really intentional about creating that space where they can connect with how do you get there? But so much of what you talked about today was instructional. It was how do you get from point A to point B when you're starting off as a new lawyer? And we are hoping to do the same and, and build that out across their careers. So I love the fact that you were like, ask, you gotta ask. So I think we have, I know we have run, run past our time and I have to tell you as it is always a joy to talk to you and, but you are never more engaging and you never shine brighter than when you are talking to young people and when you are sharing wisdom. Um, mentoring is not, um, not something everyone can do. It is, it's a skill and a gift and you have, you have the gift and you have spent years and years honing the skills. So thank you so much for sharing your insight, your energy, your spirit with us. And um, we are, if you're, I, I know you said that you will be open to mentoring. So you may be hearing from some of our students <laughs> in the future who will be reaching out. And of course, our African-American alumni reunion is coming up in March. And so we are hoping that you'll be able to connect with us again there. Uh, were there any last questions? I'm going to give I'm going to give Hattie the last word from the students to say her thank you and goodbye. Hi again. Uh, just thank you for answering all of our questions uh, so openly and honestly. Um, it's been a pleasure to hear your remarks and to share this virtual space with you, um, and to uh, really think about how 
we can, you know, choose, uh, you know, chaos over, or well, community over chaos um, and how our generation will continue to um, stand up for democracy and really ad and be advocates. Um, and do it in our own unique way with our talents. So thank you for uh, lighting a fire in all of us and motivating us to um, rise rise to, to action. Thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and uh, answering your questions. You. And well, I'll see all of you on LinkedIn. <laughs> we have a, well, thank you so much. We have a few minutes. We're gonna have Jenny is going to try to play. We have the, the governor was, uh, Lieutenant Governor, um, also a Michigan graduate. Um, his uh, sent remarks and we're going to try one more time to see if he can send us out since we weren't able to get him to, to do our welcome. But thank you so much, Bentina. It's been such a joy. We really appreciate you and you will be hearing from all of us soon. And if we were in person, you would be hearing thunderous applause right now. You would. <laughs> you would. So. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you all. That is, those are, uh, on that note, we will use those as our closing remarks. Thank you so much for those of you who we have 54 people who are still here with us after the hours. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that this was something enriching, something that just warms you. We've had so much um, negative energy, so much, so many challenges. And as we move forward, it helps to remember that as a community, there are good people doing good work and that you can do well and do good. So let's go out there and keep pushing. Let's stay together. Let's take care of each other. And I look forward to seeing you when classes start this week. So tomorrow begins our first day of class and we look forward to a fulfilling, a challenging and a rewarding semester. Thank you so much. <laughs>